Welcome to episode number 75 of the Marine Layer podcast. We welcome on Paul Sylvie, an anchor at King 5 Sports, a discussion about his career, the Mariners, and a really fun Ken Griffey Jr. story that you'll want to stick around for. The Mariners have also made a trade in the past week. They acquire Luis Urias from the Boston Red Sox and an addition to the Mariners infield that we'll discuss. Your reminder before we start the show that if you're listening to our podcast on your audio side, make sure to download our episodes, leave us a five-star review, and follow the show wherever you get your audio side of the podcast. Those reviews, the downloads, they help us out a bunch. So just take a few extra seconds to do that. Watch us on YouTube too. If you want to see the video side of the podcast, go like, comment, subscribe over there and follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts at Marine Layer Pod. Let's get it rolling. And we welcome you to this episode of the Marine Layer Podcast, part of the Just Baseball Podcast Network recording here Monday morning, November 20th. And the Shohei vibes get worse by the day. Uh, like we couldn't, we didn't think the news coming out of, from Jeff Pass and that we discussed on Friday's episode could get worse, but oh boy, it did. A report came out on Friday that apparently Lyle, according to MOB.com, the Mariners, uh, Shohei Otani is not in the Mariners' realistic plans this off season. No, their realistic plans are Luis Urias. Apparently. This is not what people wanted to read, I'll tell you that much. It was uh, it was not a fun day, and it was not what we wanted to read either. It, so the exact quote coming from Daniel Kramer of MLB.com, according to industry sources, signing Shohei Otani doesn't appear to be within the Mariners' realistic agenda this offseason. Here's a question I have on this. Do they consider realistic being it needs to be over 50% or realistic like, it's not even a 1% chance. My whole thing is, whether you think it's realistic or not, that shouldn't be an excuse not to try. What is the worst that happens if you make your best attempt? He says no, and you're in the same spot you're in right now. I don't get it. I like All the money they've been making the past few years from the TV deal, from ticket sales. You know, I mean, the ballpark was as packed as it's been here in 2023, as it's been in some time. Where's all this money going? Like you haven't spent multiple off seasons in a row. And we talked about, we thought some of the reason might be they're trying to save up to make a run at Shohei. Well, if they're not going to do that, like where's all the money going? Well, apparently Lyle, John Stanton doesn't have enough money. We did have someone who's trying really, really hard to get in our ruthless replies segment this week. And I'll give credit to him in our YouTube comments. He, he, I'll say you entertained me, sir. You you made you made quite the impact on this off season, and it was trying to make some points of why the Mariners don't have the capital to uh, to sign Shohei Otani, which you know, I just disagree. Yeah, I disagree, and I think it should be in the Mariners' agenda in some part of the Mariners' agenda this off season. Shohei Otani should be in there because if he's not, we have an issue. Look, if Shohei picks to sign somewhere else, he picks to sign somewhere else. But not trying is where I think I have an issue. And I'll tell you what, we've seen so much of the Mariners' Twitterverse split over the last few years between is DePoto's way the right way or is spending just ruthless amounts of money the right way? Because people have been very split on this for a while. And look, Twitter's not really a real place, right? Like, does the small percentage of people that scream on Twitter reflect the entire fan base? No. But oh my God, when that Shohei news came out, I've never seen this fan base in such unison. I mean, you're talking, not only were people in unison, I don't know the last time I saw people that furious. Like this might've topped what people were saying after the 54% stuff. People were mad and like beyond mad when those tweets came out. There's always people that say, oh, like I'm not going to show up to the ballpark. Like I'm going to stop spending money. And again, This is a very small percentage of the fan base, but man, there were a lot of people saying things along those lines of, I don't want to spend the money anymore, which is, I don't know. That's a little bit telling. That portion of the fan base could grow, could grow. We've heard it. You know, there have been calls. There have been people in our comment section saying no more money. And the longer this off season drags out without notable moves, it's still early. They could still blow us away this off season. But the news about Shohei, the news about the white whale, the news about the guy everyone wants the most and that people thought 
would be the most, if you're going to get any of these free agent hitters here that actually make an impact, it would be him of all of them. Seems like it's not a reality. And that's disappointing. And, and you know what I don't like? You know what I don't like when that news came out on, uh, when we talked about it on Friday and some people were like, oh, well, Shohei doesn't actually fix the Mariners' problems. You, you need two to three to four players to fix the problems. I'm thinking like, Law, were the Mariners' DH is good last year? No, and I'll throw a question back at you. Did the Mariners finish 10 games out of a playoff spot last year? No, they didn't. No, they finished two wins behind the World Series champions and the team that perennially wins the AL West and the Astros. No, if Shohei was on this team, the Mariners run away with the AL West last year. So, sure, they need to fill a few positions. Does Shohei essentially fix their problems? I would say most of them, yes. It would be nice to see him get two to three additional bats, but that one guy could do a whole whole lot in conclusion there's not been a sing. i would say there's not been a single positive vibe check so far this offseason we're three weeks in and there has been negative vibes net negative vibes i will say if you want to still look glass somewhat half full and, and there is some validity to this argument that maybe there's still a chance the mariners are internally planning to go at to go after otani And the reason industry sources are saying what they're saying is because they feel like based on what the Mariners have done in the past, it doesn't seem like they're interested in uh, shelling out that type of money, which again, that very well, that very well might be what's going on. But I guess there is still a small percent chance that internally the Mariners are planning to go after them and they're just not telling anybody about it. So if you want to look at the positive here and try to look in a positive light, you could say, okay, maybe that's what's happening. but. The fact all this is getting reported by multiple sources, not a great sign. No, it's it's uh, it's not a great sign. It's disappointing, but we still got a lot of offseason left. So buckle up, and I would say prepare not to be disappointed when he signs somewhere else. Yeah, I would agree. Unfortunately, I would agree. Okay, before we get into the Mariners' first trade of the offseason... Quick word from our friends over at Pagacha's Pub 85. Pagacha's Pub 85 in Kirkland, just east of 405. And what can you get if you head over there? You've heard it from us before. You'll hear it again. You'll continue to hear it. They've got great food, great drinks, and a great environment to go watch a bunch of sports. They got 22 TVs in the place. People gather there on the weekends during the weekdays to watch the NFL, college football, college basketball, the NBA, hockey. Obviously, Kraken season's going strong. Hopefully, they turn it around a little bit. But people are always flocking in there, and they're there to watch the games, and they're there to drink some great drinks and have some great food as well. There's some great pizza. There's a bunch of great food on the menu. And if you head in there during the weekdays, during those key hours, what can you get? Well, there's happy hour specials. Those are Monday through Friday, 2 to 6 p.m. And what features on the happy hour menu are $3 domestic beers, $4 Manny's Blue Moons, $4 Mac and Jacks, $4 Wells, and $4 House Wines. All of that over at Pagacha's Pub 85 in Kirkland. Okay, so not the blockbuster trade that everybody's anxiously waiting for from the Mariners, but they do make a trade here this past week. They go and get Luis Urias from the Boston Red Sox, a utility infielder, in exchange for Isaiah Campbell as the reliever heads back to Boston. So, initial thoughts and reactions to this trade are what? The Mariners Mariners found their platoon second baseman for the 2024 season. When I look at that, that's what this is. This is a pairing with Josh Rojas. I, I'm I'm going to imagine he's in his career about thirty percent, thirty, twenty percent better against lefties. A one thirteen WRC plus against left-handed pitchers. Uh, about a ninety three versus righties. He's a right-handed hitting infielder. At his peak, he's going to walk a bit above league average. He's going to strike out a little bit under league average. He's going to have average to slightly above average power for an infielder, around 20 home runs a season. His defense is not great. He's versatile. He plays around the infield. Uh, I'm going to guess he's going to be playing at second base for the Mariners this season as the right-handed hitting platoon uh, opposite of Josh Rojas. If if I'm going to guess that this is what his role will be, he was a two-win player in 2021 and 2022 before having an injury-riddled season last season. Had a hamstring injury on opening day, got off to an atrocious start with the Brewers, got sent down to AAA before the Red Sox acquired him, and then he was going to get non-tendered this year 
because he was due about $5 million in arbitration. And instead of him being non-tendered and being a free agent, the Mariners swung a trade for him and said, thinking he's going to pick it up and be more like his 21 or 22 self rather than his 2023 self in this 2024 season. I see a platoon second baseman, though. That's what I think about this. This, to me, says two things. Number one, it is a stopgap until potentially Ryan Bliss gets up because you don't want to rely on a prospect to save the day for you or, or even play a huge role for you because you don't know what he's going to bring. Even if Bliss ends up being really good, just to bank on that, especially with a team that is trying to contend for a World Series and to get back into the playoffs, that's not the right that's not the right logic. So to get somebody somewhat proven makes sense. This also says to me, Jose Caballero's job is probably not safe next year. No, it's not. They're, like Urias is probably a higher floor version of Caballero. They have very similar skill sets. It's like Cabby's probably a better defender, but both walk a lot. So like the one good thing about Urias' offensive profile, like he's not going to hit for a high average and he's not a huge power guy. So you're thinking, well, where's the value in that offensive profile? Well, he gets on base a decent amount. So does Cabby. But Urias has had a bit more of a proven track record of hitting, especially hitting for power as well. Um, and they're, you know, ballpark peak around a two-win player each. So it it works out. But you're right. It, his his role is probably a little bit more up in the air, and I'm going to guess they want Demo to be a little bit more free to back up in the outfield. If that's still what they feel like the role is for Dylan Moore, if I'm looking at this roster and see what fits the best, I think they want Dylan Moore more available to play in the outfield and play elsewhere besides second base. I think that's all fair. Now, we should highlight Luis Urias did not have a good year in 2023. And I mean, TJ highlighted it. He went, got sent down to AAA, eventually ended up with the Red Sox. But 636 OPS for the year. He had an 83 WRC+. Plus. It, was, it was not smooth sailing in 23 for Luis Urias. Now, the two seasons before that, they were much better. He put up two war seasons. His WRC plus was in the 110 range both of those years. So that is the version of the Luis Urias that the Mariners are hoping that they're going to acquire, and they're hoping he'll bounce back after a tough 23. But we should note, he did not have a good season this past year. So they're trading for a guy that you're hoping for some production for, but is not a guarantee to put up production because he didn't show it a year ago. And he's, I mentioned his arbitration salary. That's not cheap for a guy with a who's coming off such a crummy season that he was and for what you and I think the Mariners' budget is. It's not an inexpensive trade in, in any sense. They're trading a reliever in Isaiah Campbell. You'll have, only have to replace about 30 innings. Isaiah was very good uh, in 2023, and I'm sure the Mariners will miss him in the bullpen, and I hope he has a ton of success in Boston, but... You know, 20 in, 28 innings of what Isaiah Campbell did, about a 28% strikeout rate, a 280 RA. He, the Mariners have been proven to be able to replace that. So that's that's not really the issue there. But they are trading for about $5 million worth of salary. And Lyle and I, as much as we think the Mariners should spend as much money as they possibly can, they obviously don't. And $5 million is quite a bit more money than the league minimum that Isaiah Campbell was making. And it makes their infield more expensive. It makes their second base position more expensive. And man, I don't hope this doesn't hinder any moves because they have to pay $5 million in arbitration. It better not. If they have to, if they're holding back on making moves because of a $4.7 million salary, then you're the Oakland A's. So let's mm. hope that doesn't really make a difference. I wouldn't think it's going to. Yes, close to $5 million is not nothing, but it really should not make a difference in what they plan to do the rest of the offseason. No, it it should not. If you want a little bit more optimism about his season, once he finally, uh, his 2023 season, once he finally got traded to Boston, it was a 98 WRC plus. He got on base about 36% of the time. Which would be nice for the Mariners, especially for some of the production they got at second base last season. A 360 on base percentage would be pretty nice. Um, he did play a little bit more of a utility role in Boston, but he was pretty healthy. And just to note that utility, I mean, in his career, we're talking about a guy who's played 191 games at third, 158 at second, 141 at short. Like he can play all three positions. Now, he might not play them well. He's a negative defender for his career. So I wouldn't get your expectations too high, but I don't think that'll stop the Mariners from putting them at all three spots if they feel like they need to. 
it provides some stability for J.P. Crawford if he ever needs a day off, if Gino needs a day off. I mean, remember, Gino played every single game last year, which credit to Gino. But in case he needs a day at DH or just a rest day, Urias can play third. And again, not spectacularly, because outside of 2020, he's never really been a stellar defender, but he can play the positions. And ultimately, why did they acquire him? Well, because he fits the exact mold that Jerry DePoto talked about that they're looking for this offseason. They said, what do we want? We want to cut down on strikeouts. We want to get on base more. Luis Urias walks a lot. He only strikes out about 20 to 22% of the time on a yearly basis. So let me put it like this. When Jerry DePoto said at the GM meetings a couple weeks ago that they're looking for this type of hitter, that they're looking for guys to cut down on the strikeout rate and get on base more, we talked about we want to see that mold fit into the types of Yandy Diaz for the Mariners, which is the extreme, but players like that who can not strike out a lot, walk a lot, and also provide impact. But when Jerry DePoto said that at the meetings, like Luis Urias is the perfect example of a player who pops into everybody's heads in terms of what Jerry was talking about and what they think Jerry was talking about, because this is who he is. He is a guy that doesn't hit for a lot of force. He walks, he gets on base and he doesn't strike out a lot. So it's fine if if he's going to be the fourth or fifth bat that you acquire this winter. The problem is I don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to go get two to three bats significantly better than Urias. And he's not, he doesn't exactly raise the floor or raise the ceiling of this Mariners offense, I don't think. No, it, it's kind of a nothing burger trade. Or I shouldn't say nothing burger because Isaiah Campbell was good last year. Obviously, the Mariners can replace relievers pretty easily these days, but that's not to say that Isaiah Campbell didn't provide value last year because he did. And he was really good in the second half. So it's not a nothing burger, but it, it's kind of one of those trades that, okay, it just doesn't move the needle that much. Hopefully Urias can put up a two war season and hit a little bit better than he did in 2023 with the Mariners and can provide a little bit of value, but it's just not going to light the world on fire. And then look, there's a couple other things Urias does well. Like he hits lefties. I know you mentioned that he actually has hit fastballs pretty well the last couple of years. When you look at his run value against fastballs on baseball savant, but he's not a player that is going to come in here and make an all-star game. That's just, that's just not who he is. I did see some conspiracies floated out there that this could signal this might be the uh, give the Mariners the depth they need to trade Eugenio Suarez away, which mm, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be trading him just because you acquire Luis Urias. So it just it it presents a very interesting logjam on the Mariners infield that they have too many infielders and they it's not only do they have too many infielders, they have too many infielders who all look the same. And I'll have the same production ballpark. And by, and by look the same, you mean same profile between Correct. Rios, Caballero. You could throw Rojas. Sam Haggerty in there. Yeah. I put Rojas a step above these guys. Mm. I, I think Rojas was, I think Rojas was a step above these guys mm. from what he did in Seattle. No, no. Mm. I did. Rios put up a six thirty six OPS for the year. Like what, what, what Rojas yeah, I mean, Josh the, Rojas was worth negative wins when the Mariners acquired him this year. What what are we arguing about? I think he's okay. He's a slight step above. How about that? Okay, but if if it's only slight, then he still fits. That's not like not far, not a big enough gap. Okay, so point being, yes, th- th- they have too many infielders that probably don't hit for enough true force. Yeah, I don't know what trading Gino away would do other than I guess free up a log jam because I know while Gino has his strikeout issues. That's trading away your second best infielder. I'm not putting Raleigh in the like infield quote unquote no. dynamic here. No, that would be essentially trading away your second most productive infielder for what? Like the offense gets worse if you trade Gino away. I know. They, I know. They they need to be adding bats, not subtracting. I know. And and hopefully here in the future, uh significantly higher ceiling bats than that of Louis Sirius because Again, the needle doesn't move for me all that much with this. I don't know if this really makes the Mariners better. It might give them more options if guys go down with injury, but overall it just kind of kind of shrugs. Like it will the combination like the combination of Josh Rojas and Luis Urias essentially gives you what you thought you were gonna get with horse defense from Colton Wong 
last season, what you thought you were going to get, and see how that turned out, Lyle. An abject fucking disaster last season with Colton Wong. Like, they're essentially, if you're going to pair those two together, it seems like that's what's trying to be replicated here. I mean, both with the power profile, with the walk profile, with the average profile, and kind of with the defense profile. Like, that is what you're going to get. And I'm going to say I, I have some PTSD from last year and the, the confidence level is not sky high. They have serious work to do this winter. They need – they have significant – they have significant moving that they need to do with this offense because they have got to move some rocks to really get some bats into this lineup. Like you said, this trade's kind of – it is what it is. It's not going to move the needle that much. It'll give them more options, but it's not – it's not the true needle mover that you need. So go add One, more this winter, please. Like, like go add significant bats. Yep. Yep. I will preach that. Before we get to our interview with Paul Sylvie, let's get a word from BetterHelp. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless, if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time. Therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And it's an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you with a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in our description. It's betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. That's betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. Clicking that link helps support this podcast, but also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. Now for this interview with Paul Sylvie, if there's any way for you to digest this interview, I recommend you go watch it on YouTube. Paul pulled out all the stops on his end in this interview to give us a TV quality feed on his end. I mean, I'm serious. It looked like Paul Sylvie reporting from King five news on the television camera on our YouTube channel during this interview. So, I mean, he looked great. This is the best produced from a guest's end. no offense to the other ones best produced on the guests end that we've ever had. So shout out to Paul and the people at King five for, uh, for making this happen for us. It was, it's, it was, it was a really cool conversation with Paul. He looked great and he sounded great for anybody that's listened to Paul Sylvie throughout the years. Like, you know, he's very upbeat. He's energetic. He's always smiling. That's how he is in person too. Like, like who he is on air is very much who he is in real life. Like getting to talk to him a little bit at the game, certainly getting to talk to him during this interview. He's very positive. Now he was not so positive on the idea that the Mariners will sign Shohei Otani. I think his, I think he is more of a pessimist in that regard. And you can listen to that part of the conversation, but just talking to Paul as a whole, awesome guy, very knowledgeable has been in the market forever. And like TJ mentioned at the start of the podcast, he's got a very, very cool Ken Griffey jr. Story that we recommend you stick around till the end for. So with that, let's get to our conversation with Paul Sylvie. All right, we've got Paul Sylvie on with us. He's an anchor for King 5. He's the host of the fifth quarter, the Seahawks postgame show. And we're really excited to have him on. Paul, I wanted to call something back with you because when reading a little bit about you and reading a little bit of your bio, you talked about one of your favorite memories here covering Seattle sports was in the 95 playoffs for the Mariners were those first two games out in New York against the Yankees. So my first question with that is your favorite moment in all your time here or two losses like like can you dive in on that for us <laughs> absolutely man I mean I'm just a I'm a sports fan you know and people say you know it, did, it didn't matter to me really which team won or which team lost even over my 30 years here it doesn't matter to me if a Seattle team loses 
or wins because I just enjoy the moment. I always say, you know, I just want to see a close game when it comes to college football in this area. You know, Washington, Washington State. I don't want to see a blowout. I just want to see good competition and good games. And when we were there sitting in the Bronx and watching all that action, you know, I was fortunate enough to just take it all in. Like you're you're in the old Yankee Stadium, not the new one, the old one where all that history is. And you're listening to these New York Yankee fans just ripping into the Mariners, ripping into their own players. And I'm out, you know, we're in the auxiliary press box, so we're not in the main press box. We're just TV out of towners, man. They stuck us out in the seats, which was great for me because then you could just sit in there and become a fan. And uh, it was cool just to listen to everybody and, and watch everything around me instead of just being in this glass fishbowl watching out a window. Um, I got to take it all in. So it just took that experience of being a, a, a sports reporter, so to speak, uh, to another level. So it was very cool, man. It's a piece of history that you t- you two young lads, you'll, you'll never be able to experience that. But, but for me, that was pretty cool, man. I'm an old guy, and it was cool to be back in that stadium. I'm going to take a guess. You couldn't report any of the stuff they were telling Griffey on the air. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. See, that's what the cool thing was. Like, it was just all, you know, just R-rated, man. They're just, just swearing and, uh, and, and taking it to another level, maybe personal with the family and things like that. And, and you just shake your head and you go, man, I can't believe these guys. They, they don't care who they're yelling at. If someone does something wrong, they're going to hear about it from these fans. So, uh, yeah, it was it was that it was just being part of that playoff atmosphere in a, in a historic uh, heralded stadium like Yankee Stadium. But if we're talking about, I, I guess, like you mentioned, the story of the game, not caring who wins and who loses. I mean, the story of, of that whole series, though, what was happened when they got back to Seattle, though, wasn't it for 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 just like the riveting, like first ever postseason series win for a franchise and you know a dog pile at home plate and 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 a walk-off like that's all that you want too right well sure I mean that that adds to what I'm talking about I mean we go back to the kingdom down to nothing and it's like you know you're thinking oh they're just gonna wrap this up the Yankees have three games to uh to put this away and they never do so you know the fact that you're watching it night after night after night and you're seeing this whole uh, drama build, uh, again, adds to what I'm talking about. I mean, it didn't matter who won those games to me. It was just this c- tremendous buildup for the Seattle sports fans to watch their team finally uh, finally win a playoff series and, and beat the Yankees at it was uh, was the, the cream of the, 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 uh, the, the, the cherry on top of the, of the cake, so to speak. So it was very cool. What is it about New York sports fans, just to go back to that for a second, because it feels like nothing has changed in – all these years. I mean, even fast forward to now, when, when Joey Gallo was on the Yankees a couple of years ago, the stories were, by the end, he just wasn't leaving his apartment because fans, not just at the stadium, were giving him such a hard time, but he couldn't walk out on the street. And it sounds like when you were covering the Yankees or the Mariners in the 90s and when you were out in the Bronx, it was no different. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it just goes generations there. You know, there's generations of Yankees fans, just like there's, you know, it, there's so much more history in the Yankees, obviously, than the Mets. So it's all about the Yankees and, uh, and they're just diehard fans. And, and, uh, you know, they, they don't care if, if, you know, if a player plays well the night before, they don't care if, if he stinks it up the next night, he's going to hear about it. And, you know, I, I kind of look at that, that Philly series this year um, and watching, you know, watching the Phillies play uh, the Diamondbacks and, and then watch them knock off the Braves. It was like, the Phillies, just watching on TV gave you that moment where you're like, well, oh, this is really cool. How cool would it be to be sitting in that stadium watching this team, watching these home runs go out, watching this place go nuts? You could feel it through your television. Imagine what that would be like if you were sitting in those stands feeling it and watching it in person. And uh, now that it's just there's just something about um, a, a team with a lot of history and their fans. They're a loyal bunch, man, and, uh, and they live and die by their team. So, um, so that's, that's basically what it is. How different do you think it was from the final week of the year here in Seattle? Because I know you were out at the ballpark a little bit that final week, and obviously the Mariners were playing from behind a little bit that week. They were trying to get into the postseason and jump a couple of teams, but it was still pretty much a packed house every night. Like, like what did you take away from that final week of the year? And from what this, from what you're talking about with the Phillies and that series in Philly, like, how do you feel like the two compared? Well, I mean, the final week of the season was, was exciting, but. Um... You know, you're sitting there and you're 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 wondering, as you know, you guys follow this team, you know, day in and day out. So you know a lot about what's going on uh, when it comes from the top of the, you know, and from the management down to the players uh, and into that dugout. And you know, you're watching and you're you're wondering, you know, they, they 
they really played so well in August and just tore it up. And then you wonder if they have enough to get to the finish line. And they didn't. They didn't have enough hitting and, uh, and their pitching faltered. So uh, this is a team that is, you know, their pitching staff is the envy of many major league teams. Uh, maybe, maybe most, if not just a, a couple, that just envy the staff and the fact that these guys have so many great young arms. They have the pitching. They just need some, some hitting. And, um, you know, when you're, the cool thing about this, and I'll take you back to, to the history again, because you two are, uh, you know, like I said, to, 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 we, we've experienced some things in this town that you guys, I don't even know if you guys were even born yet when they were playing these, these playoff games. And I say that in jest, of course, but when, when the Yankees were here with Roger Clemens and, and the Mariners had uh, Alex Rodriguez and, and the team they had back in, uh, in 01, and the, the fact that, that at the time, Safeco Field was just packed. And that walking to that stadium for that series was very cool, you know, because the, you, you, it was a playoff atmosphere. It was just so much fun to be a part of. And so when I go back to, to you go across the street here just a few months ago and you see that kind of crowd and that kind of excitement around a baseball game, because this, this town would do anything to rally around its baseball team. NFL is king. I always say that. But this town wanted so badly for its baseball team to rise back up after 20-some-odd years to get to this point. And it showed because they, they showed out uh, even during the week, during the, the weekday games uh, that, that don't expect big crowds. And they were just, we can see the stadium right outside the window here at King TV. And it's just uh, people just filing in and, and the excitement was building. And it was a lot of fun. So, you know, you know we, to, to top that off, you're talking about the AL West. And people were like, oh, you don't want the Astros or, Ye- or Rangers to win. Yeah, we do. Yeah, you do. I mean, I played in the Mid-American Conference back in the day. And when a team from the Mid-American Conference would go and, and play in a bowl game, you're like, of course you want that team to win. They represent your conference. And, I, and, and this goes back to me just being kind of neutral. It's like this tells the fans across the country just how difficult it was for this Mariners team to get through its division. I mean, the AL West was brutal this year. The Rangers just tore it up. They, we all knew they needed pitching. Well, they got that pitching last offseason, and they had the bats already. So you knew they were going to be trouble, and the Astros are always trouble. So – you, you're talking about if you throw in the Mariners, you're talking about the top three teams in baseball, right? They're all in one division. So I think it was cool uh, just to, to put a cap on it that the Rangers won the World Series because it's good for the division. And Paul, I think you can relate in this back to your playing days. But not only, I mean, not only does it represent you better if those other teams play better, but it also encourages you to get better. And that's why so many, what so many people are, are just grabbing for this off season for this baseball team, but really for any team in a division, a conference, et cetera, when the other teams around you are playing better and you're still expected to be good, it just tells you, hey, we need to get that much better. And, and I think for you, I guess, in your career as well, especially as an, a former athlete, that, you know, I have to be that much better. Sure. I mean, it's what goes back to just, just to what Cal Raleigh said right after that series ended, um, right after they were, they were eliminated. Um, you know, he came out and said some things about the, the organization where they need better players. They need more players. and um, you know, it comes down to evaluating talent. And, and the Texas Rangers went out. Of course, people went right on social and they started ripping the Mariners because how come the Rangers lost 100 games two years ago and now they're winning the World Series? Why do the Mariners have to take so long to get good enough to get to the postseason? And sometimes it's just luck. You know, sometimes you, you, you spend money on a player and it doesn't work out. The Mariners have that experience. So do other teams. They have experiences of, of signing players that just, just implode and they lose their money and it's all guaranteed in baseball. So, um, you know, you, you basically, uh, you know, you look at what Cal said that day and this team needs to get better and he, they know they're not good enough. Uh, they weren't, they were that series. The Rangers talk about that series, that last weekend series in Seattle as one of their galvanizing moments where they came together and, and figured it out and got themselves ready for a postseason run, and we sure saw that. So uh, this team needs to get better, and you guys probably talk about it all the time as far as possible signings in the offseason. Who else can they bring in to power their lineup? Um, And then the other thing is this, guys. Let's face it. This is a young squad with some guys that underachieved early in the season. They need to have those guys take their game up another level. So we have some good young talent on this team, but each year they got to get better as well. What's King 5 got prepared for when Shohei signs? For what? Oh, get when, the heck when out Joe of here, man. <laughs> you, are, you are out of your mind. You are out of your mind if you think he's coming here. So like, you don't think so? I, no. Okay. No way. I said All it right. right from the right out of the gate. Um, even if he could pitch still, because, I mean, people are saying, oh, yeah, he's going he's gonna to pitch. He's going to be the same guy. He's not going to be the same guy. He's, he's just not. 
it, it, it's, you know, it would be a miracle if that guy came back and threw like he did to start the season. So I have no faith at all that he's going to be a Mariner. Uh, you, you know, you're talking about, you know what? I've said my piece. I, w- I won't even give you guys any more seconds about it, much less <laughs> minutes and hours about it. You tell me why you think he's going to be on this team. Like, do you, are you just dreaming? Partly. I yeah, also, th- yeah, I also- I'd say probably say that's fair. <laughs> I also think they were the runner-ups last time, so clearly there was some interest. I think the West Coast thing plays some part into it. I think the last three seasons with 90 wins, 90 wins, 88 wins show that they're not the team they used to be. I also think, again, like if he wants to go to the Dodgers or the Braves like it got reported today, like like sure, you can go to a team that's already a juggernaut. But they have histor- they have like so much history in their franchise already. I don't know. If he came here and he won a World Series, he'd be like that's like legendary status in this city for the rest of the time where he'd have that in other cities. But I don't think it'd be the same as winning it here in Seattle. That there, There's my pitch for you, Paul. All right. What about you, TJ? It, it reflects most of what it is. But I would say in the end, it, it's going to come down to a combination of do they think the investment is worth it? And, you know, I would think, you know, like the people who run baseball teams and especially these owners, they've amassed so much money and so much success in their life doing whatever they've done. Like, I feel like they got to realize when there's a good business opportunity in front of them, even if they don't necessarily 100% care about winning. Like we think John Stanton cares about winning, but we're not totally certain because the money's not always there to back it up. But when you look at what a guy like Shohei Otani brings in terms of marketing, in terms of press, and in terms of advertising in the stadium, I mean, that alone should sell you, let alone with the fact he's probably the greatest he, he is arguably one of the greatest baseball players to ever step on a baseball diamond. I'm not sure what else needs to be pitched beyond that for, for these guys to say, hey, we need to give it our best shot. Now, Shohei might just think like, you know what? This is an unserious organization. I'm not going to give them the time of day. That's entirely fair, but you know what? He wouldn't tell us that until he gives us his action and and goes out and signs. If he goes and signs with the Texas Rangers, I think that uh, he, might, he probably thinks that. I, I wouldn't be shocked because the Rangers don't have – any of the the past stuff that Lyle mentioned of why he thought they were a good fit in the first place. So, but if he, if he's willing to go play in Texas with that cultural fit, then that I think tells you all you need to know. All right. Now I'm done interviewing you too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, I had a question. Uh, I would say kind of branching off into your career a little bit. So I, I would say for, for most of your career, whether playing or reporting it, the two pillars, I would say, Football, like Seahawks, you know, the, the big NFL is king uh, at King 5. And and soccer as well. I mean, you played uh, and, you know, you guys do a ton of Sounders coverage as well. Where does baseball work in for for what you do and, and how you've covered sports in your career? Um, you know, I've always said that my favorite sports are football is one. Uh, hockey is one A. And then it goes, I love soccer. I played it through, you know, into college before transferring. And I'm a huge fan of soccer. I watch it all the time. I record games all the time. And people think I'm nuts for doing it. But that's just, I just love the sport. Baseball is a casual pastime for me. I love hanging out at T-Mobile Park. I love watching the games in the summer and just enjoying the action. Um, I love the, the talent and the personalities on that team now. Because, you know, that, that wasn't always the case in my 30 years here. You know, the Mariners would go through these, these times where guys on the roster weren't that interesting. Guys on the roster didn't ingratiate themselves to the fans. And the fans never got to really know them or any little piece of their personality. And, um, and so it's tough in baseball in that case. So when you get a good group of players like they have now, it's pretty cool because they're young, they're exciting, and, uh, and, they, and they're, they're good talkers. You know, they, they, they show their emotions. So um, I like this squad they have right now. And they're, the Mariners are a very likable team. But as far as baseball as a sport, you know, I got a producer here that loves baseball, and he has MLB Network on all the time. And it's just like white noise up here in the TV, you know. <laughs> it's kind of cool, you know. It keeps me up to date on some things that might be happening that I don't really care about or I don't have a, it's not really on my radar. But um, to be honest with you, you know, baseball's it's it's a fun sport in the summer, and it gets me to football season. So who's your favorite soccer player? Oh, all time? Ronaldo, for sure. Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh People say Lionel, Lionel Messi is, is is better than him. I like the power guys, the bigger guys. This guy's so good in the air. You know, you see him going and go up in the box and head these goals, and you're just like, man, how does he get up? The Ronaldo is is my guy for sure. And I wish it was ten years ago so I could watch him for ten more years. But he's at the end of his career. But he's hands down 
uh, my favorite kind of player and definitely my favorite player. So how early in advance are you scheduling coverage or fandom for the World Cup in uh, little, two years, oh, two and a half years yeah. now? Yeah, it's a little it's a little early, you know, like, um, you know, because there's there's still still some unknowns. Um, but it's yeah, I don't I'm not sure far how far out we'll we'll start talking about that. But but it's it's on our radar for sure. And you know, I'm more excited about what the Sounders are doing with their organization and and. And the fact that they have a whole new headquarters set up, you know, property, they're going to build around it. They're going to build up around it, you know, and as, as good as Starfire has been for youth soccer and, and, uh, and their, their purposes up until now, the Sounders purposes, they deserve to have their own little setup and, uh, and they're doing a nice job. And to me, it's long overdue. So it's going to be nice when that's finally done. And that'll be ready for the World Cup for sure. So that's part of the reason that, uh, that's, that the push behind getting that developed. I know you grew up, in the state of Michigan too, like and you mentioned hockey, did you grow up a big Detroit sports fan? Detroit oh, sports fan, and with that, a big Red Wings fan. Oh yeah, I was a huge, still am a huge Red Wings fan. I'm a, I'm a casual Tigers fan because I just, you know, I, I was in college when they won the World Series uh, in '84 and smoked the Padres and just rolled through that season, and uh, that was a lot of fun because I mean I could name guys on that team that would just bore you to death. That '84 team was was kind of like my era where I was like dialed in and uh but so yeah when it comes to detroit sports i'm a lions fan but it's red wings at the top for sure lions pistons are at the bottom because i just don't i'm not they've been bad for so many years i was a huge bad boys fan back in the day in the 90s but uh but no i'm a big detroit sports fan and you know what it's my it's my home state it's my hometown and and uh you know people say oh why do you like the people you see people around here representing their cities and their hometowns like it's cool man we're all sports fans and i'm a i'm a i'm a big seahawks fan as well but when the lions play the seahawks you know i'm i'm probably going to pull for the seahawks because uh you know i i kind of i work with them i like when the seahawks win because it makes my job easier let's be honest when they win my job's a lot more fun just like you guys you know if you're talking to teams and players who win it makes our jobs a lot easier and so when there's success uh you know it's cool so the lions have not have had zero success over 30 years here and uh they did the seahawks a favor last year so um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a Detroit sports fan, but my point is when you go back to Detroit, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, those are huge sports towns with so much history. And, uh, and now Seattle's become that great sports town because they're going to have an NBA team again here in a couple of years. And you're going to have all the sports represented here. You've got great college sports here. So, um, this is a pretty cool place to work. What was that like coming out here then to the Pacific Northwest and seeing that 30 years ago? Um, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you when I came out here, like, uh, you know, they had Lou Pinella, you know, so that was, that was automatic, automatically drawing me to the Mariners. Um, at Griffey, you know, you know, I came in here right then, you know, like when the, when Griffey was basically just starting out and that was cool. So that, that was helpful for me and, and, and the Mariners and watching them play. Um, but I'll tell you what, watching Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, that was my, those were my favorite times because the Seahawks weren't that great. They had uh, Tom Flores, Dennis Erickson. They kind of struggled through the 90s until Mike Holmgren got here. And then my world just went, you know, we got the Holmgren show. I got to sit down with Mike after all those games. Um, and he's so awesome. Uh, he's just like Pete Carroll. I was so lucky to work with those two guys uh, over the last many years. And so that when, when Mike Holmgren arrived for the Seahawks, my world just went pow. And then, but I'll tell you what, I never really liked the NBA till I saw Gary and Sean hook up in the nineties where alley-oops everywhere, crash and jams, the rain man, GP and, and, and all their little, uh, all their uh, supporting cast as well for those teams. And George Carl was an awesome coach and an awesome soundbite. So uh, always the most quotable NBA coach of that era. And so that covering the Sonics uh, and the Seahawks at that time was really just kind of a, you know, I just put me in this community and said, man, this is a pretty cool place to work. What about the sports town feel? You mentioned, Hey, those East coast cities, they've been around a long time. They have long standing diehard fan bases. Did, did you get that feeling when you came here or is that feeling had to grow over time? No, no, I didn't get that feeling at all. And uh, you know, Seattle had the reputation of just, Back in winters. I mean, come on, I was back in Detroit watching the Tigers play the Mariners at 1030 at night back in Michigan. And there's nobody in the kingdom. It's empty. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's 
it's you can see this team is struggling. The fans aren't backing them. And then all of a sudden they get some stars and the fans start coming around because they want to see these stars perform. So, um, you know, that that part of it, no, no, nah, Seattle sports fans – I've always had that reputation to be in fair weather. And over the last 30 years, they've gone from maybe down here on the, on the spectrum to up here now because they, you know, Pete Carroll era has been awesome for the Seahawks and all their fans. And, uh, and you know, the Sounders fans are so darn loyal. They, they stand the whole game in this pouring rain. And it's just, you know, I love the fact that, uh, you know, I will say that over the last 10 years, the, the, I think the Seattle sports fan base has, uh, has risen in crit- credibility, for sure. I mean, they're not just fair-weather fans anymore. Uh, they support their teams. And, and I'm not just saying that. You know, I've watched it. You know, I, wa- I already told you. They were not that, that, those kind of fans in that first decade I was here. But as time went on, and uh, they started caring more about their teams because there's a lot more passion in this town about, about some of these teams. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it shows. So it's, and that's another thing that makes our job fun. You know, when we get to go to the ballpark, you guys have been there. You know how much fun it is to go into a place when it's packed. Uh, and, and I will say this, man, there's nothing more fun to me than a Mariners Blue Jays series at T-Mobile Park. I mean, those Canadian fans come down there, they support that team, and it's just it's like just bam, bam, bam for three or four games over a weekend. That is an awesome atmosphere. People, You can have the Yankees, you can have the Red Sox. When the Blue Jays come to Seattle, to me, that's the best series of the summer. So we did some fan interviews, well, throughout the year, but with – Blue Jays fans specifically when they were in town and the best one we got all year was from some crazy Blue Jays fan that was out in the pen and he was he was ripping the Mariners and saying they were garbage and he was saying like like this is our home park and all this stuff and and if if that isn't that series in a nutshell then I don't know what is because I'm with you like Yankee fans flood in for those series Dodger fans like flood in Red Sox fans etc just different when it's the Blue Jays because you don't hear like the media and, and fans around the ballpark saying when those other teams come into, into the park, it's like, Oh, like they're taking over. Like they have fans, but they don't take over those blue Jays fans, like legitimately take over and they flock down for that series. So I'm with you like that series every year feels like a playoff series. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, people come here to, to watch the Yankee stars. I mean, Toronto is, they have some young stars now, but they didn't back in the day. And the Yankees have always have, you know, three or four, Big names guys coming into town, Red Sox too, Dodgers, of course. A lot of Giants fans come up and watch to watch their team play. But there's nothing like, you know, listen, I went I roomed with a couple of hockey players in at Bowling Green and uh watching Canadian fans and watching that happen, man, those guys were uh were all in and uh and you watch their baseball fans come to town and they are all in. So it's uh it's fun to be around for sure. And I swear by that series every year for sure. Okay, Paul, deep thinking question. What's your favorite story you've done? <laughs> Come on, man. I've been here for 30 years. You think I can just rattle off my favorite story? Let me see. Um, how about... I told you. Go ahead. How about favorite Mariner story? How's that? Well, I already gave you my, my, my favorite... Um, I think one of my favorite stories is this. Um, because when Griffey was here, uh, he would always, uh, you know... I'm just, I'll just, I don't mind telling you what, how it is, but when Griffey was here at first, when I, when he first got here and we, I first got here, I would watch him turn down interview after interview after interview. And it wouldn't be the nicest turn down either. It'd be, you know, uh, sometimes laced with a little, with a curse word or something. And we would be sitting there going, why don't, why doesn't this guy want to talk? And one time I got tired of it. And I said, you know, cause you know, at one point it's kind of man to man. It's just like, Hey man. I walked up to him, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, well, what's the deal? So why don't you, why don't you want to talk to us as he was walking back in the dugout? And I had my photographer with me. And he said, he said, what? And I said, we're not going to sit here and do a documentary on you. We're not going to grill you. There's nothing to grill you about. We just want to have a few questions with you before the game. We're not going to ask you every game for an interview, but every homestand maybe, we have a quick, quick interview with you. And I was trying to just talk to him. And he, t- he stopped and he turned around. He says, okay, what do you want to know? And from that point on, I was able to, to sit with him um, in the dugout. And this is not just, this is not me uh, pump blowing my horn at all. This is about you going up to a grown man and saying, hey, grown young man, and saying, hey, man, what's the problem? And calling him out on it. And he basically saw that and realized he was being, you know, kind of a jerk and, and changed his tune 
And from that point on, we had a mutual respect with each other. Look, we're not going to take going. I'm not going to his house for, for a birthday party or going out for drinks for him. I don't want to be his pal. I just want to be able to work with him because fans want to hear from him. And from that point on, we set up a lot of different interviews prior to game day where I would say, I'm eating the dugout at two 30 before you start stretching. And he said, cool. So we would go in the dugout and I'd meet him for an interview and we'd get it done. And, and that'd be that. And it wouldn't be, it would only be three or four questions. That's all. It's not a documentary, like I said. So, um, and that allowed me to go to his house in Florida and do a half hour special with him and his wife. And so that turned into a half hour special that ran on a Sunday night. And back then there weren't a lot of choices on television. So it got good numbers because, you know, like I said, now there's, you can, there's millions of choices out there. So we did a half hour special with Griffey and he said, I wanted to sit down with Melissa, his wife and ask him her some interviews, you know, just some, some corny uh, interview questions like husband, wife stuff. And he said, if you beat me in pool, I'll let you talk to her. <laughs> well, it turns out he stinks at pool. I'm bad at pool, but he stunk at pool. And he, and I was like, once he started taking shots, I'm like, oh, I got this. I got this guy for sure. On my worst day, I could beat him in pool. And I think he knew that. So I beat him in pool, and I got to sit down on the couch with his wife and talk to her about him. And uh, so if that was pretty much – that was a cool moment for me, being able to do that. Is it – do you think just you being kind of like – Rash is what res- resonated with him when when you kind of got on a good term with him all, all the way back when? Yeah, I think there's too many people that walk around uh, on eggshells. You know, Lou Pinella scared me, man. I mean, I, I even after a win, I was afraid to ask him a question, but he was a scary dude, an intimidating guy. And I saw him blow up a couple times after losses. I didn't want any part of that. Same with Bob Knight. I love Bob Knight, but I'm glad I never had to work with him uh, in, in the Indiana basketball program because – man, I, I would be intimidated for sure. But with Griffey, for some reason, you know, I just, um, I knew I was going to be in this town for a while. I knew he was going to be in this town for a while. I'm like, this is not the way it should be. And, um, and he was cool with it. It's not like I called him out. And he was just kind of like stopped and made him think for a second about what he was talking about. And um, he actually became good friends with my photographer who was, you know, less, in, you know, less intimidating and less intrusive to Griffey. He's like, you know, and Jay Buner was tight with my photographer, Scott McLaughlin. And Scotty got started getting all these guys' phone numbers and, and you know, just, just chatting with them all the time off camera. And I remember Jay Buner, after winning a playoff game, he came up and did a postgame show with us. And I said, hey, Jay, thanks for coming on. And, and Jay and I are friends and, and became friends after this. But he said, don't thank me, thanks, Scotty. And I'm like, okay, you know, because – he came on because of our photographer, because he, he respected Scotty and he came on to our show. And that's how that all started. That's how my relationship with Jay Buner started. So it's cool to see, like even my present day photographer, Alan Reed, he'll go to Seahawks. He'll go to Mariners. He'll go to training camp. He'll go to spring training. They all know him. They don't know me from squat, but they, they might know me a little bit from, from the guy on TV, but they know Alan cause he's at practice all the time. And, um, and that's cool. You know, it's cool to watch that relationship. He, you know, Alan can go up to Julio Rodriguez at a, at a, before a game and say, hey, Julio, can we talk to you real quick? No problem at all because he, they, he feels like he knows him. So that's kind of a long-winded uh, response to your question. But, but um, it's just kind of cool how this, this whole sports world works. You got to be cool. You, gotta be, you can't be a jerk. You just have to be, just be a good, just be authentic. I always tell people, just be authentic. You know, like when I saw you guys in the ballpark that day, you know, I was like, I genuinely was interested in what you had to say in, in your podcast and everything that you're doing now. And it's cool to see young people going out and, and, and starting those things and taking the, uh, the bull by the horns and being aggressive and hungry and, and, and wanting to uh, start things from the ground up. That's a credit to you guys. And it's a cool thing to learn about and, and, and hear about. And so it's just all about being authentic. If you're authentic, I was authentic that day with Ken Griffey Jr. I wasn't going to kiss his butt. And I was just authentic. You know, and he saw that. And he's like, this guy seems genuine. I'll talk to him. That's that's how I believe that happened. It's a really cool story. I really I I really enjoyed getting to hear that. And I think both of us really enjoyed getting to talk to you here for the last 30 minutes cuz this has been a blast, Paul. Really, we've enjoyed hearing all your stories. We've enjoyed talking Mariners with you. I've enjoyed I really enjoyed getting to know you over that last week at the ballpark a little bit and this has all been great. So really, we appreciate the time and hopefully we can do this again soon. Well, thanks, Lyle. Thanks, TJ. Thanks for having me on, man. And uh, if you guys ever need me to, to fill some time, you, you know where to go. Just, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll jump back on with you. But I appreciate you letting me uh, talk a little bit about my life as well. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Paul Sylvie. Awesome guy. Fantastic to talk to. And he's filled with a bunch of great stories. So we hope you enjoyed listening to him. With that, that'll just about wrap up this edition of the Marine Layer Podcast. You guys know the drill. If you want to listen to the full form podcast, you can do so on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon, wherever you get your audio podcasts. Go follow us, download our episodes, leave us that five-star review. Reviews and downloads help us out a bunch. If you can just take a few extra seconds to do that, follow us on YouTube. Go like, comment, subscribe over there. Watch on the video side of the podcast, and then check us out on social media, on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts, at Marine Layer Pod. That's TJ. I'm Lyle. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.